Hello and welcome to Responsible Government Contracting. This workshop is part three of a three-part series introducing government contracting. Today, Mr. Andy Bennett will discuss responding to requests with winning proposals. Thank you and find us on the web at nc-rgc.com. Last one. Oh my God. Let's just, oh my God, Eddie, I forgot that quick. <laughs> which is pricing and proposal, you guys. Um, he does do this on campus also, so you can get that one-on-one -on -one experience on how to price and propose, but we also do it virtually. As you can see, if you do have the time, um, or if you in the area, please tune in on one of the times that you can, uh, able to yeah. do one of these workshops on his third one. Um, he does do this every month, and uh, there will be another hybrid section in March. Um, I will get the dates out for you uh, later on in the chat. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. I love him to death. <laughs> Thank you again for doing this workshop for us, Andy, and we greatly appreciate it. You can go ahead and take over. All right. Sounds good, Patricia. I appreciate it. Um, let's, we're going to get some slides going here in a second, so I'm going to, I'm going to get this all set up. Um, how who do we have on the on the call right now Let's we have brandon, brandon and, and oh we've got deja yep you're back brandon <laughs> have you been on a call before brandon have you been on a workshop before yes i i'm uh for, uh, I'm, i feel real bad about missing the second one i wanted to catch all three i caught the first i caught the first uh so I know you have some more dates that you'll be doing the second one again. So I just have to tune back into that one. But yes, I've I've watched you. Yes. Oh yeah. No. Every month, um, we'll do we'll do all the three workshops. So it's that's not an issue. Um, so welcome back and glad you glad glad you could join us today. Um, appreciate, it, appreciate it. Glad to be here. I'm gonna see if we can get this going. If not, it's not the end of the world. We're just gonna go straight into it today. Um, Brandon, if you can, I kind of talked to Deja before, but if you want to tell me a little bit about your company, what your expectations are, have you done government contracting before? So I'm ex-military. Um, okay. When I haven't done contracting before, I want to get into government contracting. I've been on the opposite end where we've awarded contracts and things of that nature, but it's a task. You've actually issued the contracts yourself? Yeah, well, I was part of the venting process um, um, for rewarding the contracts. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. And then just so I can, I'd like to tailor to, to, you, to you guys, to the audience. So um, what line of business are you looking to be in? What, what line of business is your company in? Well, right now I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm an upstart consulting uh, organization business um and i want to get into uh contracting or like i said i used to, I, I was in it the it field okay uh, i did some hr in the military so i'm trying to expand some things but i, I just want to see um you know like i said it's it's different from the other the other perspective as far as it's easy to um i, I never took it i never thought it was it would be this hard per se you get them <laughs> say because i mean you know when when people are coming in um, you know, you you just look at the paperwork. You you see if uh if they have your qualifications and whatnot. You know what I'm saying. So I I, I understand how how the uh the contracts read and things of that nature. But um, getting back into the flow of actually knowing the people in different organizations, whereas yes. you were already in the organization and you knew people, it it was a, now I see why um like general dynamics would come up and uh. And they would just be in our office twenty four seven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's products and doing all kinds of stuff, right? Trying to rub elbows and shaking hands and kissing babies, you know. <laughs> well, so so that's kind of how I break things down, Brandon. And what Deja's seen before is um, the the way I look at things in this world is the I call it the four legs of the table. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've got the different people that sit around the table just kind of as a review. So we're all you know on the same page because it's going to matter today what we're talking about actually writing the proposal. 
Um, the four legs of the table are the audience that we as companies are talking to, right? right. Our proposals are going in front of, of the government people and those government people. So the first one's really finance, kind of set them aside because you're not going to deal with the finance people until after you get the contract. So, you know, they're, they're critical to the process, but they're more of an advisory and a support function. So I like to set them aside. Um, the other one is the, is the commander, the boss, the general, the major, the secretary, the director, whoever that is that's in charge of that organization, of that unit, um, they're setting that in your military, your former military, so you can appreciate the term, um, broad mission type orders, right? So those are the general direction that the organization is going to go in for usually this year, right? So they usually give that kind of direction a year at a time. Right. They, they also are not making day-to-day -day decisions, so we're going to set them aside. Um, so the finance people and the commander, the boss, they're, they're advisor and support. So they don't make, it sounds odd because it's totally different in the commercial world. Um, they don't make the decision of who gets the contract award. The ones that we're going to focus on are the end user. And that's, that's the technical expert, the subject matter expert, the person who's closest to the work that's actually being done. That's the end user. The other side of the fence is, um, is the contracting officer. And that contracting officer doesn't, they're not the expert in the, in the thing, in the work that's to be done. That's the end user's job. Right. But the contracting officer knows how to go through that process. They know how to go through the contracting. They know how to go through the, you know, the acquisition steps. And they're the only ones that actually have the authority. It's called a warrant. They have the warrant to write and issue those contracts to award. It's their signature that's on the bottom of the contract. Yes. So that separation between contracting officer and end user is really where this, you know, this conversation starts to make sense. Because yes. when we're, whether you're doing a quote, you know, where it's just a, okay, I'm selling pencils and my price per pencil is $5. So this is, you know, this is my quote or a full blown proposal where you're having to write out a description, more narrative, more descriptive. Right. The audience that you're talking to are those are the the end users and the contract officers. Another name for end users, project manager, program manager, that type of that type of operational person. Exactly. Um, and they are each of these people are going to be looking at the same set of documents. They're going to be reading the same words, but they're going to be looking at it from two different perspectives, right? So we need to make sure in in our responses as we talk through today in our responses, we're actually speaking, we're, we're, we're talking to both of those audiences. We're talking to the end user and the contracting officer. Right. So at, as, we get, as we get into this, um, we're, we're gonna break down, um, Brandon, have you registered at all with, um, hey Banky, how you doing? I don't know, if Ban is Banky us? <laughs> or is that another participant? Okay, great. Hey Banky, how you doing? <laughs> He's another um, person. <laughs> great, great. So, and just for um, for clarity, guys, jump in, ask questions. I can see the chat screen also. So um, hop in. This is a workshop. This is not a lecture. So I'll keep talking until somebody tells me to shut up. So just ask questions. If something doesn't make sense or I'm saying something too, too fast, uh, just, just stop me and, and ask. Um, so like we were saying, we've got the different personalities that are reading our proposals. In part one and part two, we kind of talk about the registration and the actual um, the actual research part of, of this world. So I'm not going to rehash a bunch of that. If you miss that, come back next month and do part one and part two, and then part three we'll do again, and you know it'll start to make more and more sense. This has taken me 20 plus years to figure out, and I still have a lot to learn. So you know, come back, ask questions, pick up a little bit, pick up a little bit more next time and just, just keep at it. This is not an easy world. Okay. This is not, this is, this is, this can be very, very challenging. So stay persistent, stay, stay consistent and, and stay at it and, and you'll, you'll get there. So just, uh, just bear with it. Um, so like I said, thank you. Appreciate it. So what we're looking at here guys, and I think you guys should be seeing the slides. If not, they're up here on the screen here. So this is me. Um, you know, this is my company. So my contact information is out there. So please, please feel free to reach out. Um, we talked about the four legs of the table here and then the process. 
right? So that end user over on the left-hand side here, um, they are the ones that come up with the requirement. So this process all starts with them. And we talk about this, like I said, in part two. That end user comes up with the requirement. The contracting officer goes out to industry and does the competition stuff. This is where we are taught. We talk about this a lot also in part two. Um, this is the process. It's long, it's complicated, but not every single contract goes through this entire process. All right. So the request for information, the sources saw that early stuff that's going on at the beginning. Um, sometimes they do that. Sometimes they don't. If you are a small business, you need to respond. You need to have registered in sam.gov and you need to have a capability statement all right i'll say that again you need to be registered in sam.gov and you need to have a capability statement capability statements you can google that look for it it's a corporate resume it's it's your story in one page what's your nikes code what's your cage code um, what type of business are you in a little description some pretty pictures and some colors make it your own make it your, it is your business's resume to the contracting officers why is that important in in two of the steps up here in that pre-solicitation phase that's the early phase where the government is shopping around the contracting officer doesn't quite know yet but they're going to shop around and they're going to figure out what it is that they they want to buy more importantly if you're a small business this is where they decide if they're going to set aside the contract for a small business. So if you are not respond, if you aren't responding to sources, thoughts, and RFIs, requests for information, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because Brandon, like yourself, former military, so that means right off the top, you're a veteran-owned, you potentially a veteran-owned small business, right? If you own 51% or more of your company. Um, you can you can register and get certified as a veteran-owned small business. If you have a, a service disabled, you know, if you have a, a service-connected disability, then you can register and get certified as a service disabled veteran-owned small business. That's three percent of the federal budget that has to be spent on you right there, right? So three percent of the con three percent of the contracting officers, every single contracting officer's budget has to be spent with veteran-owned small businesses. If you're a minority. 5% uh, of minority businesses, 5% of the contract budget has to be spent with minority companies, 5% with woman-owned small businesses, and the last one is 3% with hub zone, historically underutilized business zones. How is that? It's a dance, right? So you and everybody else cannot get on the phone with contracting officers all day long. Contracting officers don't have that many hours in the day to take phone calls from all of us knuckleheads out here trying to win their business. So what we have to do, what the contracting officers do, is we have to do this dance and respond to each other through this process. In order for a contracting officer to know that there are enough small businesses to respond to that specific effort, they might have five or 10 different contracts going on at any given time. But that particular one, for them to know that there's enough small businesses to do that type of work, they go out and shop. Hey, industry, hey, businesses, we've got an RFI out, a request for information, respond to this and see if there are enough companies that do this work. If they get, if the contracting officers get two or more, it's called the rule of two. If they get two or more minority owned companies to respond to this particular effort, that contracting officer will likely set aside the competition for minority owned companies. Same thing for the other categories. What does that mean? Instead of competing against GE or Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Khaki or SAIC, any of the big companies, you are only competing against other minority-owned companies. You are only competing against other veteran-owned small businesses, right? So that drastically reduces the competitive pool. That's a good thing for you. So how do you get there? Respond to the RFIs, respond to the sources sought. That's how the contracting officers know that you exist and are interested in that particular effort. Moving through this process, we're gonna get down to here for the RFIs piece now. Don't get scared off by this because I'm showing you all of the steps. 
if they're buying pens and pencils or, you know, HubSpot consulting services or whatever it is, they're not going to go through all of these steps. I promise you. If it's a multi-billion dollar contract, they're going to go through all these steps, right? So battleships or paperclips, they're, this is the process. It's the same process. So complicated it may be, but once you kind of figure it out, you've got it. Part two, we also talked about Nike's code, so I'm not going to belabor this point. This is when you register your small business. This is how you tell the contracting officers what it is you do. Um, are you into chairs? Do you build, do you, do, you, do you sell chairs? Well, if I'm a contracting officer and I, I look at that, that Nike's code to me is 337214, but another contracting officer might see it differently and a third might see it differently, right? Don't get seasick, guys. We're going to change this up a little bit. There we go. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, so these Nike's codes are going to tell the, they're going to let the contracting officer communicate with you and say, I'm buying chairs on this contract, or I'm buying IT services on this contract, or I'm buying um, you know, medical devices on this contract. Those would be three different Nike's codes. Because when you're doing that research and finding those opportunities, you need to be able to filter through and, and, and find the ones that you care about. The small business categories we talked about before, um, this is the list from Small Business Administration of what the NICE codes are. You look at, you know, if you're in janitorial services, 561720, oh, back up. So if you haven't been on the class, NICE, I'm saying it NICE, some people pronounce it NIAX. It's um, North American Industry Classification System. So North American Industry Classification System. Six-digit number tells what kind of business you're in. This chart tells what is considered a small business. So janitorial services, if you made net, I'm sorry, gross revenue uh, for the past five years on average of less than $19.5 million, you're a small business. Congratulations. If you're in remediation service, environmental remediation services, you're a small business as long as you have less than 750 employees, right? So that's how they determine, that's, that's the no kidding answer of how they determine if, they're, if you're a small business or not. Okay, so uh, Banky, I'm starting a records document management consulting firm focused on supporting small businesses, also teaming with Prime support capital construction and infrastructure projects. Okay, great. So you're, you would need to, and that's a great, thank you. That's a great example here. Uh, because if you are searching for opportunities that, um, that are construction, you want to, if you're an, let's say, let me say it this way. If you're an electrician, you're not, going to find a whole lot if you find the electrician, the electrical contractor NICE code, and you go search for that, right? Because that contracting officer can only pick one NICE code for the contract. So what they're going to do is they're probably going to find a general contractor or GC construction project NICE code. That electrical component is going to be part of it, but the electrical, the plumbing, the carpentry, Right, all of those pieces are not going to be called out independently. They're going to roll up under the general contractor Nike's code. So you need each of you need to think about your business. And sometimes the government may, may buy exactly only what it is that you're selling, or you may be the electrician, the plumber, the carpenter that is part of the larger pie. And you need to be searching under those, uh, the, those GC NICE codes and then partner with other GCs where you can be a subcontractor, right? So that's, that's individual business specific. All right, so um, we talk about the research and targeting in part two. Now we're actually gonna get into the, the documents themselves, all right? So when, I'm gonna go off screen here because I'm gonna do some searching. So if I, I need internet, so let's see if I can do sam.gov. All right. So if I have sam.gov, this is, this is a website we talk about in um, 
in part one. Spent a lot of time on this in part one. So I'm going to do my little sign in here that I only have to do once, right? And then once I sign in, I have to do my little credentialing. And my two-factor authentication from my phone for the next 30 seconds, it's going to be, and this is a free service. This is sam.gov. You don't pay for this. This is free. I'm going to go up to search. I'm going to start typing in. So let's do, um, Brandon, you were the first one to kind of talk about what you do. So you said you're a HubSpot, you're a HubSpot consultant. Brandon, you might be on mute. Okay, I'm not finding HubSpot. So let's see, Banky, you said um, Document management. Okay, so let's look for records. Let's do records management. Okay, so we've got 3,300 results. That's good. Um, okay, so we talk about part two or part two, we're going to, we do the research. Um, I'm going to go ahead and filter that down. So if you missed it before, just um, catch it then. So the dates, it takes me, let's say, do in the next three months. Okay, we're down to 700 response or uh, opportunities notice type. I'm going to filter this by that timeline we looked at a second ago on the slide deck. Free solicitation, solicitation, and combined synopsis. I already did my keyword search, so I don't need to do the Nikes code. Let's just leave that. I do not do a set aside, I do not do a place of performance because of how the government is weird. So I'm gonna look through these and I'm gonna find opportunities that look good. And each of these, this is one, you know, this here is one, this here is another, right? So there are 736 results on that search parameter. So I'm gonna look through this very, very quickly and I'm going to find ways to make my life easier because I'm not in the business. I'm in records management. I'm not in searching for opportunities on Sam.gov. That's not what I get paid for, right? So it's what I get paid for, but it's not what you get paid for. So you need to make this process as painless as possible and as quick and repetitive as possible so that you can get through the opportunity. Set, set aside the ones that you don't care about. Do not try and force yourself to be a round peg in a square hole for every single opportunity that comes up because you're going to be wasting your time. You're going to be chasing ambulances. Don't do that. Don't waste your time. One thing, one trick that I found is on this little mouse, they've got a wheel bar or, or a scroller wheel here. If you click on it, it will open up a new tab up at the top and you can just uh, glance through real quickly which ones look interesting. All right, so maybe that one, not so much. Maybe that one, not so much. Medical billing, maybe that's interesting. Let's go ahead and open that up, right? See how it opened up a new tab up here. Um, those, not so much. And I'm just going through these real quickly to see which ones I care about, which ones that want to make it to the next level of review. Um, okay, these, not so much. And if my search parameter is not getting me the kind of results that I want, what do you do when Google is not giving you the answer you want? You change the search parameter, right? So you might change that up. Is, is records management not hitting? Okay, let's find something else. Let's start with that. Let's use that as an example. So this is an opportunity and these all look the same. The logo, is going to be the, the agency's logo that's actually doing the buy. The short title is what this is called. This notice ID here at the top, 
that's going to be this that's like the social security number for this contract throughout the bid process so that one's a good id to track to make sure you're talking about the same effort tell the chain of command right here so health and human services is the is the capital office then indian health services and then the actual office that's doing the buy this is the contracting officer this is where the contracting officer drinks their water from the water cooler right that's their office down here it says the stage that we're at okay so this is actually a solicitation and you can see when it's due this is due updated updated date offers due march 2nd so it's february 21st right now so if we can get a proposal in by march 2nd we're good we're on time okay if there's a set aside it's going to say it right here if you don't qualify for that set aside move on the NICS code, temporary help services. So that's where the NICS code comes in. Remember, you're never, ever, ever going to see two there. I have never seen two. The, the contracting officers have to just pick one there, like we talked about with the electrician. So this description is where we start to actually see, and that's the meat of what we're going over today. We've researched, we, we've registered, we've researched, and now we're responding. All right. So this response part, I have to know what it is they're asking for so that I can tell them that I can do it or not, and so that I can price it out. I need to understand the details of the job. They're going to tell me the answers to the questions. They're going to tell me all the details because they want to make sure that I can price it correctly. We're going to talk about three sections today. And that's going to be price, past performance, and technical. Some will call these chapters, some will call these volumes, some will call these sections. You can call them whatever you want to, but this is um, these are the three sections. I've seen up to five and you know they can fluctuate a little bit, but these are the primary three sections that the government consistently goes back to to ask for, to ask for information. So let's break down each of these one at a time. First, uh, let's do price. Pricing is an art as much as it is a science. It's illegal to give the government anything for free. So you can't go in as a loss leader. Some people will say, well, I'm just gonna earn the business. I just wanna get in the door, foot in the door, that kind of thing. They will disqualify you. Here's how they do it. The government will do what's called an independent government cost estimate, all right? So that IGCE, independent government cost estimate, is where that end user and the contracting officer will come together and they will say, you know what? I think this is a $100,000 deal. I think this is, this is going to take about $100,000 to do this work. That independent government cost estimate is going to set a benchmark, IGCE, for the government. Okay. The contracting officer is then going to say, okay, I feel like this is a plus or minus 20% kind of deal. So they're going to go up 20% and they're gonna go down 20%. So let's call it, I'm assuming $100,000. So let's call it 120 and let's call it 80. All right, so these are now, this is now the competitive range. Again, the term for this is competitive range. So if you are a contractor, you don't know this. This is not public information. This is private government only information. This is inside baseball. But they do this on all the large efforts, anything above a certain threshold. So if you are company A and you submit a bid there, maybe it's, you know, $90,000 and your company B, you know, you submit a bid there, maybe you're $110,000 and your company C, you're right on the money at $100,000 right there. If you're company D and you shoot low for $50,000 or 
or if you're company E and you shoot high at $150,000, you are going to be disqualified because you are outside of the competitive range. You don't know that you're outside the competitive range until you get disqualified. But the punchline here is that for pricing, you need to read the documents and you need to price accordingly, knowing that they're going to disqualify you if you are so far high or low, right? Because the way the contracting officer interprets that is this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This guy's going to put the government at too much risk because if it's a hundred thousand dollar job and they're only asking for fifty thousand, they're going to come back to me to ask for more money later, and I don't have it, so I'm not going to award them. That's the whole logic around this pricing exercise, right? So the independent government assessment, you're not going to know that. The contracting officer has um, discretion if they want to go up or down 10%, if they want to go up or down 20% or a dollar value, they will set that, they will set that parameter. And then that is the established competitive range. If you're outside of that, you're done. You know, go go bid to another project. When you're doing your pricing, there are two schools of thought, and I recommend both of them, right? You do both. Understand your business and understand what your costs are. How much does it cost you to do the job? Then understand what the sell is, how much are uh, the competitive range? How much are the other people charging to do that to do that same work? So here, this is the cost model equation for government work. You take how much you have to pay the employee or how much your raw materials cost, depending on what it is, right? What is your, it's called cost basis. So you take your cost basis, you put in your overhead and your general and administrative GNA. This gets very, very wonky very, very quickly. I could spend hours talking about just this, all right? So suffice to say, how much does it cost you to do business? How much, I'm sorry, how much does that thing, whether it's an hour or the raw materials, how much does that thing cost you? And then how much does it cost you to run your company, right? How much does it cost you to do business, to operate, right? That's all this indirect rate. And then you have to make some money. You are, if, unless you're a non-for-profit, you have to make some money. So that's where the profit comes in. So you establish your profit. And then on the sell rate, that's what this equation spits out is what your sell rate is. On this other side, this is the this is the price model. So if you sell markers and you go to Target and they're selling their marker packs for forty two bucks, you know Walmart's selling theirs for forty four, and uh, Publix or wherever selling theirs for forty five, and you want to come in at the lowest price, so you're going to set your price point at forty two thirty five, right? So you're kind of working backwards. One way is building up from the from the bottom up. The other way is working from the outside in, right? So there are two different schools of thought here for pricing. I recommend doing both independently and see what you come up with. If you come up with the same number, bingo, you've got your price point. If you come up with wildly different numbers, you need to look at that critically, right? You need to understand why that is. And that's why you're in business. So make, make decisions about why you're in business or um, what your price points need to be to stay in business. Okay, so that's pricing. <clears throat> Now let's talk about past performance. I like archery, bows and arrows, right? So in archery, we shoot at targets that look kind of like this. All right, so that bullseye is in the center. That opportunity that we looked at was health and human services. So past performance is just what it sounds like. How have you performed in the past? The government, is especially those contracting officers, they hate risk. They are very, very risk averse. So the contracting officer is going to look at past performance to say, yep, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's done it before. All right. But if I wear a health and human services shirt, right, I wear Indian health services. That's my job. That's my agency. You know, that's my college team. I'm going to like that team more than anybody else, even if they're federal government. So in past performance, if I have past, if I as a company that's bidding on that job have experience with health and human services, that's bullseye. If I have experience with that particular office, 
that's bullseye, right? That's the center target. That's the past performance that I'm going to use in my proposal because I can show that I've done this work within the past three to five years and it's about the same size. They're saying this one's about 100,000. I think this one's about 100,000. So I have experience with this agency recently and relevantly, right? So size, the 100,000 and the time, three to five years is typically what it is. That's going to be center bullseye. That's the one I'm going to use. If I have Department of Transportation work that is also the same type of work, it's also within the past three to five years, but it's not Health and Human Services. It's a different agency. Okay, still good, still close, but not quite bullseye. Still, still okay. Um, maybe you know other agencies that are less similar. You know, Department of Defense, maybe military is a lot different than Health and Human Services. Um, and then maybe commercial, right? I haven't done this work for the government before, but I've done this type of work before. Recently, past three to five years, relevantly, it's the same type thing for about $100,000 or whatever the size is, but it's not with government, it's with the private sectors, with commercial businesses. I'm still gonna put that on my, on my target, okay? They always say that there's always gonna be a disclaimer that says, um, the lack of past performance is not a disqualifying event. Um, okay, but if you if you lack past performance, if you do not have past performance, partner, start out as a subcontractor. That's usually you know that's usually a good way to build up credentials and build up past performance because that's a third of the evaluation process here. The last part I'm going to table because we're going to do some writing on that. So that's the technical piece. So we've talked about price, we've talked about past performance. Now on the evaluation step, this is where, the I'm gonna scroll through this. Okay, so this is where the government has a little bit of discretion. The contracting officer has two ways to decide who wins, only two ways whether it's you know battleships or paper clips, it doesn't matter. Lowest price technically acceptable. I know it's a mouthful. Lowest price technically acceptable and best value. You may see those terms changed slightly, but that's, that's the baseline, right? LPTA, lowest price technically acceptable and best value. LPTA first, what is that? All of us industry guys that are out here are reading this proposal. We're going to submit proposals. Here's our response, right? So we submit a proposal. This is the stack of proposals that the government contracting officer have gotten in. They're going to look only at the number, only at the bottom line dollar. They're going to put the inside the competitive range that we talked about. They're going to take the lowest price and put it on top. And then the next and the next and the most expensive at the bottom. Again, within that competitive range, outside the competitive range, they get tossed. But inside the competitive range, least expensive on top, most expensive on the bottom. They're gonna take the first one, the top of the stack, which means the least expensive proposal, lowest price. And then they're gonna move on to the next step, technically acceptable. They're going, the contracting officer is going to hand that proposal, only that proposal, to their end user, partner, to their, you know, their, their end user. And that end user is going to read it and say, yep, this guy knows what he's talking about. It is technically acceptable. It does what we're asking them to do. It shows me that they're doing and they know what they're talking about. Technically acceptable. They win. None of the other proposals get read. If it is not technically acceptable, it fails that, this one gets tossed, and they move on to the next proposal. They read that, technically acceptable, they get an award. Not, they get tossed. And they repeat this step, they repeat this process <clears throat> until somebody is technically acceptable and they win. That's LPTA. Best value. It's only one or the other, it's not both. Best value. <clears throat> the government gets to decide which of these categories is more important? The technical, the past performance, 
or the um, or the pricing. Often, the government will say the technical is more important than past performance and price combined, or technical and past performance are more important than price combined, or the order ranking is technical, past performance, and then price. So that allows for the government to weight and give points. And there's a lot in color coding. There's lots of different ways to do that. But suffice to say, the government can say, the good idea, the technical approach is more important to us than the price. And based on that valuation, the government will select that, um, that award, that contractor to be the award. All right, so now we kind of know how they, how they decide. We know what the different categories are. Let me show you what this language actually looks like. This is pulled straight from the headlines, if you will. These are actual contract basis. These are actual RFPs that were out, and I've just snapshotted the screen here to show what it is. So federal acquisition re regulation says, um, for those conforming to the solicitation, will be most advantageous to the government. Price and other factors considered. The following factors shall be evaluated. Technical past performance price. Technical and past performance when combined are significantly more important than price when being evaluated. That is a best value evaluation. That's a best value contract. Um, LPTA. This contract will be awarded on a lowest price technically acceptable, blah, blah, blah. Right. So this is an LPTA. That's the other category. They're telling you how it is right here. Um, this one down here is using a different terminology, but it's the same thing. It's a best value, but they say best benefit. All right, so they say best benefit. Um, the government will evaluate technical, past performance, and price, um, blah, 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 right? So instead of saying best value, they say best benefit. So if you're keyword searching and control F and looking for those words, best value, and it doesn't show up, or lowest price, technically acceptable, and it doesn't show up, Read the document, award basis, that's usually where they put that kind of thing, but it's, it's gonna be in there. They're gonna tell you how they're gonna select. Okay, so now let's go back to our proposals here. And let's look at this one that we were talking about for Health and Human Services. I see the solicitation number request for proposals, that's telling me the stage. Firm fixed price, right? So they're telling me, that's again, another deep conversation, but that's telling me the type of contract that it's gonna be. And the next code, um, just a cleanup piece, administrivia. Make sure that you double check your SAM.gov profile for the bids that you're, you're submitting to make sure that your SAM profile has the next code for the contract. Takes about 15 minutes to update, but you don't want to you do not want to submit a bid for a NICE code that you don't have on your profile, because then the government's going to say, well, this guy says he's in IT and he's bidding on janitorial services. What the heck, right? You want to make sure that that doesn't confuse contracting officer, because I promise you they will check. Um, okay, they're telling you uh, billing technician hourly 2080. 2080 to me, that's one that's one man year. That's you know a full time equivalent in FTE. If you take, um, actually, that's not a bad thing to go over with, with everyone here. So if you're pricing out labor and you're doing labor services, let's do some math real quick. How many weeks are there in a year? 52. How many hours are there? How, how many hours are there in a day? Billable, eight. How many hours are there in a week? I'm sorry, how many days are there in a week? Five. Eight times five is the 40. So we have 40 hours, 40 hour work week, right? We all know that, 40 hour work week. There are 52 weeks in the year. So 52 weeks in a year times, four, times um, 40 hours in a work week is 2080. Now we have to take out, so that is the baseline equation for an hourly rate. If you wanna know what your hourly rate is ever, 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 I will stand up on a table and jump up and down so that this makes an impression. 
I see so many people mess up this equation. 2080, if you have $100,000 a year employee, if they make $100,000 a year, and you want to know what their hourly rate is, you always divide it by 2080. Always, always, always divide it by 2080. That's the number. That's the cost basis on that equation that we were talking about before. That is the hourly rate, okay? Your starting point. Then you put indirect, you put your overhead and your GNA and your profit on top of that, right? So that's the equation. When you start taking out vacation time, you don't get to bill the government directly for vacation time. You don't get to bill the government directly for holiday time. You still have to pay your employees for it, and that's fringe benefit. We talk about that another time. But depending on how much <clears throat> vacation you give your people, three weeks, two weeks, whatever it is, that's where you will see 1920 and 1880. 1,920 hours workable, billable in a year, or 1,880 hours billable, workable in a year. So that's a full-time equivalent. When they say 2080, that's a little sloppy, but that's okay. That's just extra billable hours for your employee. They're not taking any vacation or holiday, apparently. Um, those are probably going to be multiples of that. That's three technicians. That's 6,240 6, hours. So this is telling me this is um, this effort is for three full-time employees, three technicians. This is all FAR instruction, federal acquisition regulation. The last thing I want to make sure I get in front of you guys is instructions to offers. So we're going to find one real quick here. Under technical, we're focused on technical now. The things you're going to look for depending on the agency that you're talking about, section L and section M. Two different sections, section L and section M. Um, you wanna keyword search instructions to offerers and evaluation factors. Okay. I'm going into this proposal blind. You guys saw me just keyword search or just find it, but we're going to find if I can spell instructions to offers right there. All right. So I'm going to read through the entire document, but the entire document is 26 pages. I'm whittling down what I care about, and what I want to spend my time in response to. And I may only respond to four or five or 10 opportunities a month, depending on how much, you know, how much bandwidth I have. So here, where it's starting to talk about evaluation factors, I'm looking at, okay, price 60%, technical combined with solicitation requirements, 20%, past performance, 20%. So they're telling me their weighting criteria here. Automatically, that's a best value, pro that's a best value um, contract. They're telling you instructions to offers <clears throat> right here. So they're, they're looking for right here. Okay, so I know what I'm looking for. I come to it relatively quickly. Don't get frustrated with yourself if it takes you a minute to find it. It's okay. It's going to be there. They're telling you, right? So I started with the keyword search of instructions to offers. I'm going to look up and down in the document to see where it is. Same page, a couple paragraphs up, is this right here. What do I see? Included with each proposal, identify technical capabilities and compliance with all solicitation requirements, PWS's performance work statement, and at least three references with past performance, exactly what I was telling you before. Complete and attach the three. So that's, this is a um, Indian owned company set aside. So Native American owned. So that's what the IEE document is. And then past performance references <clears throat> with a point of contact, telephone number, contract description, contract number. So 
they are looking for you to describe the type of work in your technical. We already talked about past performance. Now we're going to look for that performance work statement that they describe. Another word they use here a lot is scope, scope of work. Okay, they don't have it, so we're going to go back. And again, not going to get frustrated that it's not there immediately. I'm going to look through the document and see where it's telling me what the work to be done is. Okay, right there, first page, description. The primary purpose of this contract will be to obtain three medical billing technicians for one year purchase order in accordance with performance work. So there's going to be a performance of work statement in here somewhere. I'm going to find it because this is, there it is right there. So we're page nine of 26. It's telling me exactly, and this is very, very, this is very, very standard. Okay, whether it's product or services or Indian Health Services or Department of Defense, this style is very, very common. So if you're going to respond to this and everything so far is looking good, specific, to, I'm going to look for what the work is to be done. The contract billing technician shall, shall is a buzzword, right? That's a legal term. You have to do that. Perform essentially the same duties as those required by government civil service employees on similar duty as assigned. And it's going to tell me what it is that they're doing. Maintains files, uh, prepares authorizations, releases, qualifications. Okay. So this page and a half right here is telling me what the, it's, this is the dance, right? So the government's saying, hey, go do this. Now I have to speak to that contracting officer and that end user and tell them that I'm going to do this. But what I cannot do, and what you cannot do, is parrot the sow. So I know we're running short on time here, guys. So if you have drop, I appreciate it. I'm going to go another five minutes or so, then I'll open it up for questions. <clears throat> we're in Tampa, so we have Gasparilla down here. You know, it's our, it's our party kind of thing. And, you know, the pirates at Gasparilla have these parrots on their, on their shoulders, right? Polly want a cracker. So if you're... And they're kind of cute at first, but then they get really annoying because they squawk, you know, probably want a cracker. If you're that parrot and you're just saying back to the government what they've already told you, you are parroting the sow. You are parroting the PWS. You are parroting the scope of work. So if the government says all claims, including manuals uh, to be generated, and you say our technicians will include manuals and claims to be generated. You're just regurgitating back to them what they've already told you. What you should do is paint a picture and tell a story. Tell your story. I'm not gonna give you English lessons right now, we're running short on time, but you have to describe to both the person who has no idea what the work is, the contracting officer, but also a subject matter expert in that field, how you're gonna do the job that they tell you, that they're telling you that needs to be done. Our firm has, maybe I will do a little bit of this. Our firm has you know, 10 years of experience providing um, claims generation support to multiple federal agencies. Um, our process includes a document, an initial document review, um, technicians assigned to each effort, uh, to each claim will be um, given a 24 hour period to review, to provide initial guidance and review. And then that uh, initial review will be escalated for peer review. And then for management approval, you, you're, telling them, and what I just regurgitated off the top was a paragraph of your response, right? So you're telling them how you're going to do the thing, how you're going to do the thing, 
right? Past performance is historical, past tense. I did that. The technical proposal is how you're in the future going to do this thing, okay? And then how you're going to do that thing, and then that, and then that, and then that. And you can do it in the same order that they did it, or you can mix it up and, you know, say, you know, combine different pieces, depending on what your style is. But you want to be very, very clear and address all of the components that they tell you that you need to do. That's painting the picture as you're telling your story of how you approach this project. All right. That's it for today. Um, like I said, we will pick back up next month with part one, part two, and then do this again for part three. We're in person here on part three at HCC Del Mabry campus. Um, and I'll open up to campus uh, to questions. All right, guys, I've got everybody on mute. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, are you going to shoot these slides out? Say, say again? Will you shoot these slides out? Will these slides be available? No, um, I'm, they have to record it for the, for the community college, but um, you can go to my website and look for this if you like um, right. for some of these videos or just you know hop on. I do this, like I said, every month. So if you miss it or you want to do screenshots next time, just, um, just hop back on. Excuse me. Yeah, I appreciate how you broke it down. Um, it, it again, it reminded me actually of being up in the office and reading these things. It, it's kind of um, it, it seems simple, but like you said, once you get the flow down, I think it would be pretty good. Yeah, and I mean that's a great point, Brandon. I appreciate it. They all, I mean, they're not all the same but they use the same structure, right? So, you know, you might have a truck and a car next to each other, but they're all driving on the highway and they all have four wheels, right? Some, you know, they're all basically doing the same thing. The documents may look slightly different, but all of the stuff that we talked about is gonna be in there. All right, guys, I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you guys on future workshops. Thank you for your time today. We hope this workshop was instructive and informative. Please find additional accredited courses and other support services on our website at nc-rgc.com 